here from Monty Garcia Closas, who is going to uh, be our third speaker, and then we'll hopefully have time to be able to comment on all of the uh, 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 really important points that have come up from the two uh, talks so far. So, Monty, over to you. And if you have more questions, please put them in, in Slido. Polygenic risk course seems to be the talk of the town. I have even been asking dinner parties about polygenic risk course because of the increasing popularity of direct-to-consumer genetic testing. So what are polygenic risk course and why are they so popular? Polygenic risk course are combinations of single nucleotide polymorphisms, and this is the most common form of genetic variation in the human genome. So we know from genome-wide association studies of breast cancer that there are probably thousands of these single nucleotide polymorphisms that are associated with breast cancer risk. Each of those are associated with a small increases in risk. However, when we put them in combination, they could really tell us about the um, genetic predisposition to breast cancer. What's important here is that they can tell us about this genetic predisposition, not only for women with a family history of breast cancer, but also for most women in the population that don't have a family history of breast cancer. So the question here is whether polygenic risk scores can be used to tailor prevention, early detection, or even treatment strategies according to a woman's risk, rather than using a one-size-fits-all approach. This is certainly a very attractive idea, but it's also very controversial. The number of polygenic risk score papers is increasing very rapidly. Even for people like me that are working in the field, it's really hard to keep up with everything that's going on. Just in the last year, we have seen a number of position papers in high impact journals that have, are trying to address exactly the question that we are trying to address here, which is whether polygenic risk scores are ready for clinical use. In the next 20 minutes or so, I will try to give you an overview of the, what we know and we don't know about polygenic risk scores to help us address this question. Like any medical test, genetic tests need to be shown to be valid and useful before we can think about implementing them in either a clinical or a public health setting. When we talk about validity, we are talking here mainly about two main concepts. One is the analytical validity, and the other one is the clinical validity. When we're talking about the analytical validity, we're talking about the qualities of the laboratory test. That, so it's trying to identify the genetic variants of interest. Versus with clinical validity, we are talking about the association of these genetic tests with the risk of disease. Here, I will be focusing on clinical validity, which is my main area of research. Clinical validity is about predicting risk. So if we think about a group of women without breast cancer, we could apply a polygenic risk score test and assign each of them a risk score that will tell them about their probability of developing breast cancer over a specific period of time. Once we do that, we could then stratify women according to the risk um, going from the highest to the lowest uh, risk of breast cancer. This risk score is normally distributed where most women will be at average risk, and then we will have extremes of women at high and low risk. So how good are polygenic risk scores at predicting risk? This can be measured in two different ways. We can be looking at the calibration of the polygenic risk scores, and calibration is really about accuracy. It's answering the question, how close is the predicted risk from the actual risk? A second measure of the how good polygenic risk scores are is uh, race discrimination. And race discrimination is answering the question of how well can we separate women according to risk using these polygenic scores. Let me talk first about calibration. In order to look at calibration of polygenic risk scores, we need to group women according to the risk of developing breast cancer. For instance, here we will be having three groups, women at average risk, at low risk, and at high risk. 
So what we will be doing to look at the calibration will be following up this woman across time and then observe how many women in each of these groups develop breast cancer. And we will compare that number of observed breast cancers to the predicted number of women that will develop breast cancers according to the polygenic risk score. The accuracy of the test can be visualized using uh, what we call calibration plots that plot the expected risk in each of these groups according to the observed risk. So if the calibration is good, then the observed and expected risk will be equal and all the dots will follow uh, into this diagonal line. This is a calibration plot for a polygenic risk score of breast cancer that included 313 single nucleotide polymorphisms. Here, women were divided according to the signs of risk. So we have here 10 groups, around three in the previous example. And we can see that all the dots follow into the diagonal line. So we see a very good calibration. What's important here is that data from used for this calibration plot came from 15 different prospective cohort studies that included over 230,000 women that were followed up over time and 6,000 cases developed uh, after follow-up. Um, another important point is that this data from these studies was not included in the genome-wide association studies that were used to derive the um, polygenic risk score. So that really represents an independent validation using prospective cohort studies. I'll just show you that polygenic risk scores are very well calibrated when they are derived from large um, genome-wide association studies. Next, I will talk about risk discrimination. Discrimination refers to the spread of risk. That is, how well can we separate women um, according to the risk of developing breast cancer? Polygenic risk scores are often expressed as risk percentiles, and that refers to classifying women according to where they fall in uh, the distribution of risk in the population. We usually have finer um, risk categories at the extremes of the uh, risk distribution to better understand what's happening um, and for women at the very high or very low risk of breast cancer. What I'll show you in the next slide will be the lifetime risk of developing breast cancer for women that follow into all these different percentiles. This plot shows the different life trajectories that women follow depending on their uh, polygenic risk score. Women in the middle percentile will have a lifetime risk of about 10%. This is in contrast with the women in the top one percentile of risk that will have a lifetime risk of up to um, 30% with a much steeper um, trajectory. And co in contrast to women in the bottom one percentile of risk that will have a lifetime risk of about 2%. And the risk of the women in the top one percentile is similar to the absolute risk um, that we see for women carrying uh, monogenic mutations. So this is really a, an important um, separation of risk. This plot is for women in the US uh, that are of European ancestry. So what happens when we look at other ancestries? It's very different. Here you can see that for African-American women, the separation of risk is much narrower. It goes from 14% to about uh, 4%. So why is that? So the main reason is that the genome-wide association studies that have been used to derive polygenic risk scores have included primarily women of European ancestry. So it is critical that we increase the sample size for women of other ancestries to really be able to attain similar levels of risk stratification across different um, ancestry groups. And this is important before we apply polygenic risk scores in the population because we could be exacerbating health disparities by having a, a test that performs better in women of European ancestry than other ancestries, for instance, in the, in, in the US population. So the data I'm showing here is actually for ear positive disease. The picture for overall breast cancer will actually look very similar because most breast cancers are ear positive. But I wanted to show you ear positive um, breast cancer to contrast that to uh, similar plots for um, ear negative breast cancer. Here is how it looks like for ear negative disease. So I'd like to make two main points here. 
first compare to ear positive uh, breast cancer, we can see that the baseline risk is lower for both groups and the level of restratification is narrower. Um, however, the pictures between European and African American women here look more similar than what we've seen for ear positive. And it's because African American women have a higher underlying risk of ear negative disease, um, which makes the curves to be shifted up. Uh, that really highlights um, the need to improve restratification for aggressive subtypes across all populations and indicates that African American women could benefit most because of their underlying um, higher risk of ear negative disease. Another way to look at risk discrimination is using what's called the area under the curve. This is a measure of the overall uh, risk discrimination, and you can think of that as a measure that correlates with that spread of risk um, at the population level. And there under the curve, 0 0.5 means not discrimination. And we can see here that um, women of African ancestry, consistent to what the data I showed you before, have a lower risk discrimination than women of European ancestry. And I'm showing you this plot to show also data from two other recent studies that have shown that the risk discrimination in other populations of East Asian, Latin, and Hispanic backgrounds is actually closer to the European. The reason why these are so different compared to the African ancestry population is because genome-wide association studies used to develop the polygenic risk scores rely on the correlation of genetic markers um, in, in the populations under study. And this correlation is most distinct between African ancestry and women of other ancestries. Again, highlighting the need for increased um, sample size of studies. So the question is how much better we can get for uh, polygenic risk scores. So we've done some analysis and we've uh, determined that the theoretical maximum area under the core we could ever get using polygenic risk scores is 0.7. So here we can see that there is definitely room for improvement um, for stratification uh, across all the different uh, groups. In order to keep increasing our knowledge of the polygenic architecture of breast cancer, we are conducting the Confluence Project. This is a large multi-ancestry breast cancer genome-wide association study that's bringing together multiple breast cancer consortia to maximize the sample size and the diversity of the study populations. This sample size that we're gonna be attaining here, about 300,000 breast cancer cases and 350,000 women without breast cancer is approximately double the sample size of the current genome-wide association studies. The diversity is also much larger and it will include over 100,000 women of non-European um, ancestry. The study is ongoing. We are currently genotyping samples and we are still interested in, in, in increasing the sample size for women of non-European ancestry. So if you would like to know more about the study or know about studies that, that would be interested in, in joining this large effort, um, I would be very interesting to hear about that. Until now, I have been talking about polygenic risk scores, but as an epidemiologist, I need to point out that polygenic risk scores do not work in isolation. They are correlated with family history and they work together with other um, risk factors for breast cancer. For instance, reproductive factors, as well as environmental factors uh, like uh, lifestyle. There are also other biomarkers for breast cancer, like mammographic breast density that can be determined when women go under um, a mammographic screening program, for instance. So when we're thinking about a woman's risk, it's important that we integrate all of these risk factors, all our knowledge about breast cancer to provide the best estimate of the probability of developing breast cancer. I also wanted to point out that risk is a probability and it's an estimated probability. And the more information we know about a woman, the better will be our estimate of the probability of developing breast cancer. And this can change over time, depending on different um, risk factors. Uh, for instance, having a mother being diagnosed with breast cancer will change the estimate of my risk, as well as the amount of information that we know about a woman. The more we know about a woman, the better will be our risk estimate. Building such integrative multi ethnic risk models for breast cancer is the main goal of the Breast Cancer Risk Prediction Project. This is a project and study that started about a year ago 
and it's funded by the National Cancer Institute and is coordinated by Pete Kraft at the Harvard School of Public Health. Here I'm showing the populations that will be used for model development as well as for independent validation of the models and that includes a, a large international collaboration of 23 prospective cohort studies for model development and this model development will include information on polygenic risk scores being developed uh, from the Confluence project. And here they will be integrated with other risk factors for breast cancer. And those models will then be validated in healthcare systems and mammographic studies um, in the US. To summarize what we know about the clinical validity of polygenic risk scores, I hope I have shown you enough data to demonstrate that there is high quality research that has demonstrated that polygenic risk scores are a good measure of risk. However, most of what we know today is based on studies that have included primarily women of European ancestry. There are large ongoing efforts happening today that should give us results in the next few years that will result in improvement of, of risk stratification for women of different groups. Let me now talk about clinical utility. Demonstrating clinical utility is considered to be a key requirement prior to implementation. And this is about assessing how useful the test is to improve clinical outcomes in a particular setting. Demonstrating clinical utility is complex and it involves many perspectives and considerations. There are interests of different stakeholders, could be patients, healthcare providers, policymakers, insurance, laboratory, regulatory bodies that all have to be taken into account. So we will there need to think about aspects related to acceptability of the test for women that are taking the test, issues related to the delivery in the healthcare system, how to scale up the delivery, how to be sure that it's done in an equitable way. People worrying about the cost of, of a new intervention will be thinking about cost effectiveness considerations. And there is a wide range of ethical, legal, and social issues that also need to be taken into account. Clinical utility is really context specific. It really depends on the difficult balance of potential harms and benefits of the intervention that we are considering, whether it's a behavioral change, risk-based and mammographic screening, or selecting women at high risk that could benefit most from interventions, uh, either uh, medical or uh, surgical interventions. There are a number of studies that are trying to assess the clinical utility of free space screening for breast cancer at the population level. This uh, is a, an example of such study, the perspective study, which is a series of pre-implementation studies that are trying to provide information for the Canadian healthcare system so that they can make an informed decision about the potential implementation of free space screening either at the population-based screening programs or in the setting of high-risk cancer genetic clinics. And this figure here illustrates the complexity of issues that are being considered in this program. Another example now in the US of studies that are trying to evaluate risk-based mammographic screening is the WISDOM study. That study has been led by Laura Esserman at the University of California in San Francisco and is aiming to recruit about 70,000 women in different um, areas of, of the United States. The study is comparing risk-based approach for screening compared to annual screening. And it's allowing women to decide whether they wanna be randomized into these two different arms or whether they wanna select uh, one of them. And then women will then be followed up to try to understand whether these two different approaches make a difference uh, in, in health outcomes. The study is still ongoing, and if you're interested to know more about that or potentially participating in the study, um, I'm sure uh, Laura Esterman would be very happy to hear from you. Suzette de la Lodge from the Institute Gustave Rosy in France is leading the MyPEPS study. This is a large randomized screen-based trial in six countries in Europe that's aiming to recruit 85,000 women to compare the clinical outcomes of a risk-based approach to a standard approach for breast cancer screening in these different countries. This is uh, studying uh, risk-based screening in a very different setting than the uh, 
wisdom study in the U.S. because these countries have different healthcare systems, and that's absolutely critical for the implementation of these um, programs. You might be wondering which risk tools these studies are using, and the answer is that they are using different risk tools that are shown here. The kind of risk is the tool that's been used by the prospective study. These uh, studies are also working with other commercial or go government laboratories to um, produce a clinical grade tests for polygenic risk scores that will be able to um, be used um, in the clinical setting. There is already uh, kits that can be used for um, uh, uh, obtaining uh, clinical uh, risk scores that include polygenic risk scores, and that includes the MITE risk. And in the future, it would be important to compare side by side all these different models to see which ones actually perform best when um, applied um, in a clinical setting. The trials I just mentioned are going to be providing very important information about the clinical utility of risk-based uh, mammographic screening, but trials cannot answer every question and risk tools are going to be evolving. And you cannot have a new trial every time we are um, improving our way to assess risk. That's why it's also important to use um, data from observational studies. This is an example of a very large study that just started in the UK. It's a prospective cohort study that is planning to recruit about 5 million participants in collaboration with the National Health Service in the UK. This is going to be a very large research resource and it's part of the UK national genomic strategy that's going to also evaluate how polygenic risk scores can be delivered at scale. The study, as well as the trials and other uh, ongoing studies that I don't have time to mention during this talk, are going to inform future policy decisions. So I hope that gives you a flavor of the complexity of assess assessing clinical utility of polygenic risk score and all the ongoing research that's happening to address this question. As different institutions and countries are starting to implement or thinking about implementing polygenic risk scores, uh, they are facing a complex considerations that are going to be critical for the successful implementation of risk stratify early detection and prevention of breast cancer. I would like to conclude my talk by um, quoting the most recent update of the NCCN guidance that are saying that polygenic risk scores should not be used for clinical management at this time and that the use is recommended in the context of research. And here I would like to extend not only clinical trials, but also observational studies and uh, collection of real world data that all together is going to provide essential information uh, necessary for the change of these guidelines. So stay tuned, there's lots happening. It's a really uh, exciting area of research and we're already starting to see early stages of implementation of polygenic risk scores. These are more likely to start and then already starting in the context where we already have uh, risk assessment tools, where we are incorporating our peer polygenic risk scores to improve uh, that assessment, to apply existing clinical um, guidance that are based on risk thresholds. Implementation of population-based um, screening programs will take longer. And my guess is that we're gonna be seeing a lot of progression in the next uh, five to 10 years. And I would like to finish by acknowledging my collaborators, both at the National Cancer Institute, as well as other institutions around the world. They're really an excellent group of investigators that are working towards a common role of understanding the polygenic risk of breast cancer and how that could be useful um, to improve early detection and prevention. Thank you for your attention, and now I'm looking forward to the question and answer session. Okay, I'm sure you 